So to get a better understanding of this whole issue surrounding professional indemnity insurance, and just insurance in general, I've asked my good friend to join me. I'd like to introduce you all to Grant Mason from Also Insurance. He's a good mate of mine and my insurance broker. Welcome to the show, Grant. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Florian. So you've, um, you've, I sent you the article from Victoria where it's just highlighting the issues with regards to particularly the fire cladding and in this circumstance, building certifiers. And I know I've just paid you a lot of money to renew my insurance this, uh, this year. So um, like a week ago, you bastard. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I noticed there was a clause in there as well. I made sure to ask you about, about that, which was um, the non-conforming clause with regards to fire cladding. So it, it's, you know, it's, it's coming here for, or for cladding a whole lot of other things, an exclusion. So it's, it's hit the architects. So what's going on with the building certifiers? How do you think this is all going to work out with them? You know, the insurance company's just being greedy or? So I suppose we can take a step back and look, it is a really difficult situation when you are in that profession, um, there is those exposures. Um, so look, I'm certainly not going to sit here and pretend to make uh, insurers what's real sorry for insurers because I'm the first one to have a go at them and, uh, and, uh, make sure that they're treating people right. Um, they are businesses when it's all said and done. They bring in uh, premiums, they pay out claims, they pay expenses, all those sorts of different things. Um, when there's a sudden change, and cladding's a prime example, where you all of a sudden see a whole heap of change in the industry, that can create a lot of issues um, around current policies in place. Now, in the nature of the way these policies are, professional indemnity is what's called a claims made policy. I'm not going to sit here and bore everyone about uh, how the structure of these things are. But one of the advantages of a claims made policy from the insurer is they really look at everything every year and make sure that it's the right uh, policy, sometimes for them, sometimes for uh, other people. And when you've got businesses out there like building surveyors that aren't always tied up with associations or things like that can create gaps in the market. Now, going back to uh, one of the areas where we're saying that they may not be able to get their licenses and that because of their experience. It's from what I can see, and Corin, you probably know better than I do with how these things and how the article says that you can't have exclusion. I can't see anywhere where it actually says you can't have exclusion. They tend to be under the licensing situation, uh, tends to be more with an acceptable insurance policy. So that's a stop you go and getting a cheap casting policy from someone that covers you for nothing and therefore leaves everyone else um, in the gun and you are not free. So that that's um, uh, consumer protection really, isn't it? To ensure that uh you know, mum and dad aren't going to be left high and dry because they've got someone with a, you know, a PI insurance that's just, you know, not worth the paper it's written on. That's correct. That's correct. Now, as I know, we've even had the discussion previously with, uh, with the, about this very exclusion with your insurance as well. Um, well, yeah, I brought, I brought that up, the... up here on the screen for everyone to yep. see just the, um, the non-conforming non-compliant cladding exclusion for 2018 they've, they've brought into it which um so it's, it's, one yeah. thing one thing to remember here is the term about uh non-conforming non-compliant so with a lot of things especially when and i'm certainly not here giving our legal advice um all sorts of trouble if i do oh, if, uh, if, an, if anyone if anyone comes to my channel for legal advice, they've got a whole lot of other problems, <laughs> mate, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but quite often we fall to the reasonable person test when you actually do get, say, in front of a judge and these sorts of things where some of these cases can come through. Now, if it's reasonable that when something was actually put in place, so for example, let's take one of your beautiful uh, architecture uh, drawings. Um, and at the time, it was deemed that there was no non 
compliant coding that you were using. It wasn't non-compliant. It wasn't even deemed as non-conforming or anything like that at the time. Um, and a reasonable person in your situation would have been fine to use it. I don't see there being a major issue there. Has someone actually gone in there and said, oh, I'm not sure about this. This could be borderline or um, this could be dodgy. Hang on, this is the same stuff that burnt on uh, the tower in London or something like that. There's a different story involved there. And that's where they're really trying to understand is they're trying to protect um, is against that blatant use of, let's say, rubbish. So trying to uh, address these issues and from the in insurance company's perspective, I mean, they just want to manage their risk. So that that's absolutely. So that's why all of a sudden these these certifiers are finding that their premiums have gone up, their excesses have gone up, because you know this well, material that's coming is just exposing all the, these businesses to risk, and that's all that's all that they think about, isn't it? Absolutely. So there's two sides of it. Um, you use an example of um, accountants in the late nineties. This was before I actually started in the insurance world. Um, <laughs> they were, for a while there, they were almost uninsurable. They Who, didn't, account, they, accountants? Yes. They found that they had um, prices of premiums and excesses that were just absolutely through the roof. Um, now they're probably not even, some accountants are probably less than 5% of those premiums, if not lower, and much better things. But that's because the actual industry moved together and became a lot more regulated and a lot more um, able to be uh, insured because they actually had better um, risk management internally. Um, another example is property valuers. They're almost impossible to insure these days. Uh, and if they do get insured, they're very expensive because they are a law upon themselves at times. I know there's some very good ones out there, but there are some uh, interesting ones and i think you've dealt with a couple in your time too sorry <laughs> never mate never but so <laughs> so actually you that's kind of a, a positive takeaway that you've got there you this is really a market response to an industry that may not be mitigating or performing as well as it should mitigating the risks and the example you gave of the accounting industry so then that industry stepped up to address those risks and improved in the long run there's probably some teething issues that we're going through and it it, it kind yeah. of so, yeah another example which they use um the victorian um, um premier uses the term of insurer of last resort which they've done in other things and government can actually jump in on that they did it with um the surgeons and doctors and things like that um yep. and i'm not going to bad mouth any medical people People here, but if I tell you that they deal with it, they need to ask them to see what the rest of the world deals with. Um, but they've got certain things set up where they start with they've got an insurer of last resort. So they have there has to be an insurer out of the panel of five or six of them out there that has to insure them. They got a maximum um, premium, which I know you certainly don't on your uh, architecture business. You got a maximum excess applicable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those things and after a certain amount of claim the government actually pays 50 percent of the claim above that so it helps they co-insure with the insurer to make it insurable ah okay so so through the government the as a community we're assuming that risk or we're, we're dulling that exposure for the insurance companies so it's making it viable for them to actually assume that that's right so Hence, the premium stay more reasonable and affordable so people can still have doctors out there um, as a prime example of surgeons and things like that. But we're not going and spending, I'll say, USA rates on uh, doctors and surgeons and things like that. And okay. the people actually have the ability to practice this without going bankrupt just every year on their uh, insurance premium. Okay. Oh, so that's um. Sorry, I'm having an issue here with the with the software. We'll have to stay in this view with the insurers at the, at the minute. Okay, so that that's um. 
That's interesting. So wh- where do you think the future is for all of this? And what, you know, if um, make some, what would be, I don't know, the, the best case scenario, say you've got certifiers, they can't actually, um, you know, get their insurance or their premiums are too high. Do you think the government will step in and become an insurer of last resort? Do you think it'll be a temporary thing or, or what do you think well, would happen? First of all, I will, I find it interesting. It will be interesting to see how the governing bodies and the licensing groups handle these exclusions. Um, so, as I said before, the term acceptable insurance policy rather than uh, is brought up and used in there. So, if they deem the current policies are available as acceptable, then obviously the, the um, everything keeps going. Um, there's also the that may be deemed acceptable, and we'll see that the government government may stand in as that to look after anything that comes from the cladding side of the area or where you can't get insurance. The air, groups that are probably much bigger and can afford it, there's always areas you can get into good, irrespective of um, what's available in Australia. There's many places in, uh, around the globe that will insure these areas, so you will pay for it. And getting someone to be able to actually access those is a very small group of insurers, uh, insurance brokers, etc. Um, but that's what happened with accountants for a while. They'll start to have to use what's called unauthorized foreign insurers, um, where it was a much higher premium, a much higher access, and what's deemed as an unauthorized insurer in this country. It doesn't mean it's illegal, it just going to go through a fair bit of paperwork and uh, specific reasons of you can't get that insurance in Australia um, to be insured. So I think uh, overall, look, government could well step in, particularly in the short term. Um, the licensing groups uh, definitely um, can be probably a bit more flexible or on their interpretation of what's an acceptable insurance policy, because the last thing anyone wants, and particularly any government wants, is our construction to shut down. <laughs> Oh yes, now that's definitely a vote winner. That one, isn't it? Um, yeah. It, it. I feel like every day I'm just talking about more and more construction issues and disasters and, and things like that. And um, I, and I mean, I suppose I, that is. Sorry. Oh, keep going. I said, say that even leads into selling your home, so you get pre-purchase inspections and things like that. So that's where that could even get into that area in the next stage as well. So all of a sudden, if you shut down the construction industry, you could very easily shut down, let's say, the whole property industry too, that you can't actually sell a house. What What about the, the people that do the uh, pest and building pest inspections as well? Uh, I mean, there is potentially uh, exposure there. Um, that hasn't quite hit their, their policy yet about that. I think I suppose they don't have any direct dealing with, but at the same time, Insurers tend to, and as you said, it's a risk of insurance uh, book here. And when an issue like cladding happens, it happens all at once. We've seen a fair bit of it in the last what, year, two years, uh, kind of thing. It's not just a one off situation. We've seen it in numerous uh, areas around this country alone, let alone uh, internationally. Um, and that has huge ramifications for the whole market in the insurance world. Well, we're, we're looking at like I think 1400 buildings that have been identified that they're not releasing the data from and I can understand why they won't release it to in one regard because it's going to affect everyone who's in, bought in those properties but also if you're going in there you want to know about that um, mm. and the, the risk it's a case-by-case basis on how much of a risk it is on a commercial shop front you know where it's going to be less risk I'd imagine than on a balcony with a barbecue gas bottles and cigarettes and uh, we're just seeing where that's all happening. Well, Grant, thank thank you very much for for enlightening us about the industry that you're involved with on a day to day basis. I mean, what 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 takeaway could you give for people that uh, are maybe um, you know? Do you want to plug your business? You want to get brokers to to uh, or surveyors to give you a call if they? If they want to oh, look, we're, we're always happy to discuss these things with anyone. Um, we will work with you to help. But the most important thing. Is, is notifying any potential matters to your current insurance broker, especially if your policy is looking at 
going to add more exclusions and things like that. By notifying them today before, you know, it is on record on today's policy. Um, so if there, if you as a business owner have been even slightly involved in one of these buildings that may have a query about them and you're not sure, I would strongly suggest dropping an email to your broker and at least putting it on record um, to cover your backside and also everyone else's and therefore that's not going to be an issue going forward with that. Just because you're notified doesn't mean that your policy uh, goes up through the roof and all that kind of stuff and it's deemed as a claim. You're just doing your due diligence and notifying the insurer. That'd be the most important thing in that situation. Oh, Grant, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I'll talk to you next time. Take care. Thank you very much. Thanks again for joining me for this episode of Heiser Says. Please like, share and subscribe. Ding the bell to see my daily updates. And I'll see you all again tomorrow. Bye for now.